Well, good day to you all. Thank you for uh, looking in on this webinar. My name is Simon Blees. I'm a radiologist and um, I've been working in this area for over 20 years and I've been lucky enough to work with some fairly advanced uh, spine surgeons and I developed a, a big interest in uh, spinal pain and what causes spinal pain. And one of the blind spots that became apparent over time was that we tend to look at things in isolation that uh, spine surgeons and hip surgeons don't necessarily talk. But of course, as we know from anatomy, the hip bone is connected to the backbone. And so I really wanted to talk to you today about uh, what I call spinal pelvic parameters in back and hip pain and how the two are linked. The ability to look at this in a real time uh, and weight loaded positions move forwards a long way with what I call the EOS revolution. You can see here on the left, um, this is an EOS machine, which is a fairly cumbersome bit of kit. Although it produces images that look like X-rays, they're not to be thought of as X-rays. These are actually two linear scans, which are connected together uh, and processed to produce a 3D model of the standing skeleton. You can see the lights at the bottom um, of the patient, and they move up to indicate the position of two X-ray tubes that are firing across and uh, allow us to reconstruct the whole body skeleton as they move up the body. It takes about 20 seconds to complete the full scan. So we call this upright linear computer tomography. I mean, it's a bit of a mouthful, but as you know, CT scans normally look like a polo mint and the tube in that rotates around the patient, um, firing X-rays as it goes to create the image. In this situation, we have these two tubes that scan from head to foot and generate a frontal and a lateral view, which are then co-registered to create a 3D model. So it produces scans, not radiographs, and I don't want to go too much over this, um, but th this is the uh, actual result that you see. It looks like an X-ray, but it's actually formed by uh, linear scanning. And that whole process of linear scanning and very carefully uh, collimating the beam and collecting all the x-rays means that we can use a much lower x-ray dose and there's much less scatter which means that most of the received radiation that we get from an x-ray actually comes from scattered x-rays those that stay in the body and uh, and that produces the x-ray dose more than just the x-ray passing through but you can see we've got the front view and the side view here and then and the uh, the, the third picture is the 3D reconstruction, uh, which can be obviously manipulated uh, and rotated in space so you can evaluate the spinal curvature in any way you want. And this has been a big help to spinal surgeons, particularly looking at scoliosis correction. The image processing takes a bit of time. We have to drop a wire frame on and then eventually uh, position all the vertebral bodies in space, co-register and then the computer, and then you get this 3D model that you can use. Now, um, the initial impetus to devise the machine came from uh, the need to look at scoliotic curves in young people. And we know that from early uh, studies um, that patients who were evaluated, say, in the 1950s and 60s, uh, women in particular, got increased breast cancer rate uh, at, at double the risk later on in life. So we needed to have a much lower dose. Um, we also needed to be able to manipulate the display and produce lots of numbers for surgeons to plan their corrections. Um, but this is just an idea of how much dose reduction you can get. You can see at the top there, I've shown that a transatlantic flight gives you about 0.1 millisievert, um, which is about the same as a chest X-ray, but quite a lot more than for a whole body CT scan. You can see an order of, of uh, 200 times more um, potentially. The EOS comes in at just a bit more than um, three chest X-rays and two chest X-rays in a child. But recently they've devised a method of turning down the X-ray dose even further. So now we're at a much lower order of magnitude, many times less even than um, uh, uh, transatlantic flight and certainly a lot less than your annual background radiation. Um, so we have now got to a stage where we can say that these are as low as reasonably achievable and should be used for all young people who need to have a spinal postural assessment. Just a little bit about uh, the history of it. This is George Charpak, and he got the Nobel Prize for inventing this um, detector that had much higher sensitivity than most of that sort of um, particle 
detectors and they use it in CERN. So they, they found things like the, the Higgs boson and stuff with it, this kind of detector. And uh, that's the sort of the standard laboratory size. For the medical imaging, they reduced it and, and miniaturized it down to about the size of a shoebox. Uh, which is why we can now use it in a, uh, in a in a medical environment. Now, I spend a lot of my time looking at um, MRI and CT scans, and really they give us, unfortunately, what is end stage. We can see that in this MRI scan here, these discs have, have become very dark. They've lost signal compared to a healthy disc here. And then we can see a disc hernia here. Whoops, sorry. And on the CT scan, you can see that uh, we've got some very gnarly looking facet joints here and these are all producing symptoms but of course the the impact of, of whatever was going wrong with the patient's posture to cause these changes has been going on for a very long time so i call this end stage imaging and i always feel it'd be very nice if we could get in early uh, and find out why these changes eventually came about so learning about how we stand there's one fundamental concept which is sagittal balance. And effectively, the spine, as you can see, as we all know, has this sort of sigmoid curvature. It's not a straight line. If you was a straight line, the vertebral bodies and discs would basically impact into each other. The sigmoid curvature basically acts like a giant spring. So it allows the, the spine to uh, absorb uh, load and shock through life. Um, and, but these curves all have to be in careful proportions so that they balance. And this sagittal balance line um, is something where we measure it in radiology by taking the midpoint of the C7 vertebral body and dropping a vertical. And that line should pass within two centimetres either side of the posterior margin of the S1 disc space. Um, there's a lot to be said about sagittal balance, but it is... Uh, a very important concept to understand. And if it becomes imbalanced, it's one of the main underlying causes of low back pain in the adult. So this is just a little recap on how we assess it. We can see we drop this C7 line down vertically and we talk about either a negative sagittal balance where it's shifted to posteriorly or a positive where it's shifted anteriorly. This plays into another cornerstone concept, which is the pelvic incidence. And essentially, this is the relationship between the S1 end plate and the central point of the femoral heads um, and the angle formed um, uh, between them. And the French who will talk about these concepts a lot and who developed the EOS machine call this the basement. In other words, this relationship here determines the nature of the curvatures above, which balance on it, a bit like a curved uh, line of bricks, if you like. So it sets the tone for how the rest of the spine, some people have very shallow curves, some people have very exaggerated curves, but it's all derived in, in the growing skeleton from this relationship here, the pelvic incidence. And this, of course, is uh, fixed for an individual, but it can have a large range um, of, of different uh, pelvic incidences. We all can have be different heights, um, we can have different shoe sizes, we can have different pelvic incidences, but once you've got a mature skeleton, your own personal pelvic incidence will never vary. And the pelvic, sagittal pelvic tilt of the, of the pelvis will be related to that pelvic incidence. So most people have a pelvic incidence of somewhere between 30 and 60 degrees, and the sagittal pelvic tilt to balance that will be somewhere in the range of 10 to 20 degrees. Knowing that, then we can we can see whether or not the pelvic position has adapted, because if you have a pelvic uh, tilt that is outside of the range that you would expect for pelvic incidence, that tells you that the pelvis is rotated around this rotation point, which is the central head of the, of the femoral heads. You can rotate forwards, which is called antiversion, or backwards, which is retroversion. And this is just a diagrammatic uh, reminder of that. So when the pelvis tilts backwards, it's called retroversion. When it tilts forwards, it's called antiversion. So that shows you that there is a measure of accommodation if something goes awry with the, the, balancing, the balancing act for the, the spine above. You can accommodate to that. Although you can't change your pelvic incidence, you can vary your pelvic tilt. 
And these are just some examples of, of the different pelvic incidence I told you. This is the patient who's got a pelvic incidence of 45 degrees, and their sagittal pelvic tilt is measured at 10, which is appropriate. If you get to a more extreme, somebody with a pelvic incidence of 73 degrees, for example, their sagittal pelvic tilt has increased in proportion to 24. So these things always are in balance to each other, and it's when they become out of balance that it tells us that there may be something going on higher up. So the rule of thumb is that the lumbar lordosis itself should be the pelvic instance, which remember is a fixed number for an individual, plus 10 degrees. So in this patient here, you can see that they have a pelvic instance of 73 degrees and their lumbar lordosis is 69. It's a little bit low. And interestingly, if you look at the, um, the sagittal pelvic tilt, it's 24 degrees, which we, we've got tables, we can look these relationships up, is slightly high. So it's balancing it. In other words, the slight forward shift of sagittal balance caused by the uh, slightly shallow lumbar lordosis is being compensated by the pelvis tilting in this direction to keep this sagittal balance line in the appropriate place. So we can, this is how the dynamics now can start to come into play. If your lumbar lordosis varies for whatever reason, you've got some accommodation in your pelvic tilt to take that into account, to keep that sagittal balance line where it needs to be. If that sagittal balance line starts to shift forwards or backwards, that's when you can have circumstances where back pain sets up. And we'll just go through some clinical examples of that. And that's just a reminder of how we assess that sagittal balance line. We can actually vary our own sagittal bands. This is somebody doing a core exercise. So you can see standing with their core muscles switched off, their belly slightly protuberant. The C7 line drop down is right on the posterior border of the S1 end plate. In other words, that's completely normal. Notice when the core muscles are activated, the belly flattens, the lumbar lordosis becomes shallower. And look where the C7 line has gone. It's now drifted quite a long way forward. So that shows you how you can vary your own sagittal balance just by, by using your core balance. And that's an important concept to remember if you've got a patient with back pain when they go off to have rehabilitation, that they, these core muscles are very important in controlling our underlying posture. When you have a situation with old Schuerman's disease, for example, where the thoracic kyphosis has become increased because of the kyphotic change, then you, there will be an impact on pushing the sagittal balance forwards. So there's going to need to be some kind of uh, accommodation to that. Their pelvic instance, which is a fixed number for this individual, is 56 degrees, and the sagittal pelvic tilt of 7 is a bit low. And we there's, say there's a lookup table and we look these up and say, no, it should be closer to about 12, 15 degrees for that pelvic incidence. So we know that something's gone on here with the pelvis. It has antiverted, which is a bit of a strange thing for it to do. Look, therefore, at the other accommodation, lumbar lordosis. The lumbar lordosis is 82 degrees. It should be no more than 66 degrees. So this patient is accommodating their forward shift of sagittal balance, not by rotating their pelvis, but by swaying their back forwards in order to, to bring this sagittal balance line backwards. Now, that's not a very bright thing to do because you can imagine that as your lumbar lordosis increases, the pinch point on these facets at the bottom increases. So you have a potential, therefore, to get facet related pain at the lumbar sacral junction because the patient has used an inappropriate accommodation of lumbar lordosis to compensate for their thoracic kyphosis. So getting to understand and work with these numbers um, is really quite important to be giving a, a diagnosis from an EOS study of what's actually going on with posture and therefore where the pain is coming from or how it might be generated. I don't really want to labour that point too much. I think it, you know we, we can get lost in the numbers, but you you get the overall concept of of understanding the relationship between them uh, and how we therefore diagnose. This is a if you like a, a degenerate kyphosis. Again, the tendency would be for the forward shift in sagittal balance. In this patient, their pelvic instance forty eight is 
that's fixed for them and their lumbar load doses of 56 is within the 10 uh, uh, the 10 degrees it's about right therefore the pelvic tilt of 14 degrees is too high again from the lookup tables it should be closer to about nine eight nine degrees so they have retroverted their pelvis in order to bring this sagittal balance line backwards again that has a different consequence of course is that now um, there will be increased pressure on the lumbar sacral disc as a consequence of this backward tilt of the pelvis and they will get increasing tension in their uh, posterior postural muscles and a shortening of the hamstrings due to a change in the position of the ischial tuberosities these things all eventually hang together uh, and if, you, if you're interested in physical rehabilitation it's quite useful therefore to know what accommodative mechanism the patient is using or abusing in order to maintain their sagittal balance this is just a, a summary slide showing you how we uh, the these uh, lookup tables um, are, are generated from the eos scan this is the patient who's had a spinal fusion their sagittal balance line is actually in the right place. Um, their uh, pelvic incidence of 61 degrees is matched to a sagittal pelvic tilt of 22, which is tending to be a bit high. You can see it's coming towards the retroversion. We have this nice numerical scale to make it easy for us. Um, and their lumbar lordosis of 58 degrees is actually a bit flat. You can see here it's indicating as a lack of lordosis. Remember, pelvic incidence fixed number for the individual sagittal pelvic tilt up to 10 degrees higher and therefore this is a bit flat it, we often see this with fusion patients it's very difficult to accurately uh, get the lordotic angle but it's important before you do fuse that you do know what the pelvic incidence is so you should be able to target your fuse lordotic angle close to where it should be in this patient they've been fused a little bit flat which is not uncommon and therefore they are retroverting their pelvis to accommodate that flattening the lumbar lordosis shifts sagittal balance this direction pelvic retroversion shifts sagittal balance in this direction and, and they've now balanced out so that's how it all hangs together say in a, in a post-operative case it can get quite extreme here's a patient who's basically been fused flat their sagittal balance is uh, un unfortunately shifted uh, five centimeters forwards and yet they've now produced um, a, uh, a f they've not they've not sorry they've not caused any retroversion of their pelvis for some reason they haven't brought that 51 degrees and that 13 degrees in it are in proportion and that's indicated by this green zone what they've done in order to try to maintain their sagittal balances they've used a second compensating mechanism which is flexion of the knees and flexion of the hips so you can see they're developing a flex knee stance in order to try to bring the sagittal balance backwards so i mentioned before how i like to use this technique to get in early this is a 37 year old male who's got acute onset low back pain um, they've got stri limited straight leg raising and here's his mri which shows the loss of signal in the l5s1 disc indicating early disc degeneration and the question is why um, it's probably the cause of his low back pain but what do we do about it well we make an assessment um, we already know that he's got a general l5s1 disc when we look at his parameters we find that the sagittal balance it is the, the vertical line is passing through the S1 end plate. It's perfectly normal. But we've got some flexion of the knees. And also when we look at the lumbar lordotic value is 50 degrees for a pelvic incidence of 47. The predicted value would be 57 degrees. So this patient is flattening their lordosis, but also they're, they're um, bending their knees and the pelvis is slightly retroverted. Pelvic tilt 17 for the value of 47 degree pelvic incidence, our predicted value would be 12. So there's something going on here. And when we look at the uh, uh, focusing on the pelvic area, here's the whole body scan. 
um, say 20 seconds to produce that very low dose and we get a whole body analysis. So it's not just about the spine, we can look at other areas too. And you'll notice this patient has got these what we call cam deformities. You should normally have a concavity in the femoral head neck interface here, but now we have this flattened uh, ramp, as it were, from the femoral head to the femoral neck. And notice this sclerosis here on the acetabular margin. It's a little less evident on the left side, but this is femoral acetabular impingement. This patient is having uh, an impingement between the acetabulum and the femoral head neck interface. Now, what that means is that in order to ease the pain and discomfort of that, they retrovert their pelvis. That retroversion moves the sagittal balance back. So what they've done is they flatten the lordosis to compensate for that. And that, in turn, increases the axial load on the lower discs, leading to premature failure and low back pain. And they've even gone further by flexing their knees. So this just shows you, to go back through it again, this stance that they've adapted, where they've retroverted their pelvis and slightly flexing their hips and knees, is to offload the front of their hips, which otherwise they get pain from impingement. And they've also flattened their, their lumbar lordosis because the pelvis is retroverted. So all these things hang together, but you've come up with the underlying root cause is actually their hips. So is it the right thing to do to operate and focus on the L5-S1 disc, or do we sort out what's going on with the hips first? Um, this, of course, will cause lots of, of discussion between spine surgeons and physical therapists, and that's why a multidisciplinary setting is so important, where we can have these open discussions and determine what's the best thing to do for them. And in this case, um, probably a referral to a hip surgeon would be appropriate in order to try to help them regain a normal pelvic position at the age of 37. You'll often notice more elderly people wandering along with sort of flexed knees and hips and bent forwards, what we call the simian stance. And it's never just due to aging um, in, in most cases, it's due to other factors. And it, it's an accommodation to something going on underneath. Never forget that a straight leg raise reduction in young people may be due to hip impingement, not adverse neural stretch. And from my perspective, um, if you do get an acute onset of low back pain, um, treat it like a first episode of chest pain because the consequences of not getting a proper diagnosis are lifelong and the costs will be high. Um, so it's always important, in my view, to check for correctable postural causes to prevent the end stage disease of worn out discs and knackered facets later on in life. So in my book, when you have a young patient with unexplained back pain, EOS will allow you to exclude developmental anomalies and also those uh, impacts on coronal and sagittal balance. In more mature patients, the underlying cause of postural related back pain resulting from workplace overuse or injury factors uh, will be important. And in the elderly, uh, we are looking at uh, you know spinal degeneration and the EOS will help to demonstrate the postural problems and the adaptations that that patient's made. These are some of the original papers that were produced in the production of the EOS machine. The EOS machine has been available since around about 2012, and we installed one in 68 Harley Street um, in 2012, um, and it's been producing sterling services ever since then. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a lot to take in in terms of the numbers, and I apologize for all of that, but it's important to know how they, they hang together. And so a patient coming in with hip pain, particularly in their 30s or 40s, we need to get to the bottom of it. And in particular in males, we need to exclude an unexpected underlying cause such as femoral acetabular impingement. Um, I'm very happy for people to contact me after the, um, after the presentation if they want to discuss these things further or how to refer for such a study. Um, and um, it's been my pleasure to, uh, to give this short presentation to you and uh, I hope it's been of help. With best wishes, thank you.